Um, all right, so we have uh, in this afternoon session, which is not very long, it's another hour or so, uh, we have first a talk and then a panel. Um, the talk uh, will be Julie Owono, who is the executive director of Internet Without Borders. And if you were here this morning listening to Amba's talk, um, there are a few things Amba talked about, which I think so Julie's carrying that conversation forward, especially to do with data protection and privacy in parts of the world where regulation isn't as robust as it is here or indeed um, in other bigger, richer countries. Uh, so with that, Julie, it is all yours. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. This is my first MOSFET, so please uh, be, uh, be kind. <laughs> uh, so um, thanks for coming, and also thank you to those who are, or will be watching. So today, I'm going to make a case for uh, a more robust privacy uh, and data protection in, in Africa. Why is that? It's because uh, when we talk about the internet today, we talk about connecting the next billion, billions. And most part of these billions are located on this continent, uh, which is uh, potentially, uh, which has potentially seven, uh, one billion internet users. So uh, the, um, what we've been observing is that we mostly talk about market. So having those products being used by uh, a lot of citizens and users in this in this region, but we don't uh, we don't we don't talk a lot about privacy, the, um, globalizing the principles and uh, and human rights that should underlie the cyber development everywhere in the world. So, uh, as a consequence, there seems to be uh, a split between two worlds, uh, and specifically in terms of internet development. What are these two worlds? On the one hand, you have a world where, an internet world, where privacy is really at the heart of all the preoccupation. You all remember on May 25th or around when we all received those emails making sure that we consent to receive information from uh, X and Y surveys or platform. Well, this is a world that was made possible uh, with the European Union and the adoption of the General Data Protection Regulation which considered as one of the best regulation existing on the issue of privacy protection today. Such a good protection that it also inspires the rest of the world and particularly parts of the world where the world of, the very world, uh, world of regulation is not agreed upon by everyone. And I'm thinking specifically of the United States where market re regulation and specifically internet regulation is still a matter of debate. You all, you've probably all seen that this week, uh, Tim Cook, Apple CEO, called for more robust privacy protection, including in the United States with the U.S. federal law on the matter. So you have, on the one hand, this world, and on the other hand, you have the rest of the world, including, as I was saying, uh, Africa. So here's a map, a great map, that was put together by a uh, friend at Article 19, which shows uh, on the continent what governments have enacted data protection laws, uh, what governments, uh, what countries are uh, currently discussing a bill, and what countries do not have data protection at all. So uh, of, on this map, you can see that out of 55 African states, only 24 have enacted a data privacy law, and 15 are currently discussing uh, adopting such legislation. 24 is a good number, but it's not enough. And we, it should be specified that out of these uh, tw 24 countries, uh, if you look at the legislation that are applied, most of them are inspired from regulations that were put out together something like 30 years ago in the 70s, where obviously the data economy did not look at all like the one we are seeing today. So these texts normally need to be updated, but that's a matter for another debate. And this has consequences, this dichotomy, these two worlds have indeed consequences. So we live in, in, in an interconnected world with interconnected consequences. And on that, I'm thinking specifically, I will mention specifically the issue of surveillance, 
uh, ironically, if you put a map of governments in Africa using surveillance tools, it will uh, more or less correspond to the map where data protection is more or less uh, existing. And uh, this has serious consequences, so these governments do not hesitate to use surveillance products to uh, repress uh, their populations and make sure to maintain their repressive regimes of power. Uh, but not only governments use surveillance, also companies are very famous for harnessing the data to influence politics. And we all remember how we woke up in, in shock at the beginning uh, of this year when we learned that Cambridge Analytica uh, had uh, influence, has used uh, data from, uh, from various social networks and specifically Facebook uh, to influence the presidential election in the US and the Brexit debate in the UK. But uh, what was even more surprising was to learn that already in 2015, that same company was already testing its products on, uh, in a country like Nigeria, which still doesn't have a data protection law. So obviously uh, the company used uh, all the data that were available to try to influence the, um, the outcome of the vote. So we see the interconnectedness and uh, I'm talking about this because, of course, governments are primarily responsible for this situation. They are responsible for adopting the needed regulations and setting the right boundaries to protect the data of their citizens. But they are not the only ones. Companies, of course, also have a responsibility. And it's not me saying this. It's actually from a resolution that was adopted by the United Nations in 2011. Uh, which endorses what, is, what are known as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And these principles are grounded on the idea that indeed the primary responsible for in ensuring that human rights are respected and protected are the governments. But companies also have a responsibility to respect these rights and apply them and protect them. And uh, I'm saying this based on the principle number nine, which is the funda fundamental principle which should apply to companies according to these uh, guiding principles. And this principle says that business enterprises should re respect human rights and they should avoid infringing on, hu on the human rights of others and they should address uh, adverse human rights impact of their activities or their products. So you might say, okay, it's the UN, they have so many tags, so many resolutions, nobody cares. Uh, no. <laughs> People do care. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking particularly about a, a great project, uh, which is called the Ranking Digital Rights Project. So I'll tell you more about it. It's a, it's a project team that every year uh, ranks companies depending on their commitments and are their practices to protect freedom of expression and privacy of their users. So as you see, it's, also, it's uh, not only internet companies such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, but it's also telecommunications operators such as Orange or Vodafone, which is more known here. And uh, when I was first told about this, um, this index uh, back in 2015, I was amazed by the, the ambition, of course, which is, uh, at the end of the day, making sure that companies operating uh, on the internet have a, so, a corporate social responsibility and respect the human rights of their users, specifically free expression and privacy. But I also immediately wondered, hmm, what a, if it would be interesting to compare this map, this ranking, so of these companies, of how they perform, uh, in certain markets and specifically uh, in their native markets. I'm thinking, for instance, of Orange, which is a, a French company, or Vodafone, which is a UK company. It would be interesting to compare their ranking with their, the ranking of their subsidiaries and ranking of their activities elsewhere in the world, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to do that, we ask the Ranking Digital Rights team and also the support of Access Now, which is also an, another super great uh, digital rights organization to help us uh, do this research, which is called Digital Rights in Sub-Saharan Africa. So to do this research, what, what we thought was, okay, we're in, it will be difficult to make an assessment for all the 50, 55 states. 
So what we'll do is that we'll take the, the models, basically, in terms of democracy, in terms of political stability, and also in terms of language. As you know, in Africa, there are many countries speaking English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and apparently there's a, there are certain consequences, political consequences to that in the form of uh, the, um, the relationship between governments and their citizens. So we chose one Francophone country and one English-speaking one. So the Francophone one is Senegal in West Africa, and the English-speaking one is Kenya. And uh, we focused on two companies, telecommunications in particular, because they have a very important influence, and they are also leading their, leading their respective markets. So these two companies are the subsidiary of Orange, so Orange Senegal, and the subsidiary of Vodafone, which is uh, Safaricom. And uh, what we found was uh, enlightening, I must say. Uh, we found that there was indeed a severe dichotomy between the way that these companies behave when they are operating here and the way that they behave uh, when it comes to privacy when they operate in those two markets. And I'll give... Uh, Two examples. In the case of Orange, so to explain rapidly, the ranking digital rights methodology is based on a set of indicators and you have to assess for the company whether uh, the company respects or not these indicators. So one of the indicators is related to the accessibility of privacy policies of the company. So in the case of Orange Senegal, what was interesting is that when you go to their website, there is no privacy policy. You don't know what happens with your privacy when you uh, use their services. And in the case of Safaricom, while the privacy policies were accessible, either on the website or also in the contract signed with the user, uh, the privacy policy was very vague in its terms, did not tell you precisely who your data are shared with, who has access to them, what are the measures that the, the company is taking to ensure that the data are stored in a very secured way. And this has obviously consequences. In the case of Orange, when we did our investigations, we, were, we received many testimonies from users who said, who complained about the fact that they received unsolicited SMSs from companies that they didn't know and never knew they had uh, shared their data with. And in the case of Safaricom, uh, which is very interesting, we, we worked with a, a, a local organization called the International Association of for women in the radio and TV who helped us do our inf investigations. And these women particularly focused on the harms that are caused to women, gender-based violence using telecommunication tools. And in the case of Safaricom, they had made an investigation and found out that women, some women were complaining that their data had been accessed by a former, I mean, a violent former companion. For instance. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because, well, Privacy is not enough protected. Kenya does not have a data privacy, privacy law uh, for now. And in the case of Senegal, while the data privacy law exists, the problem is that the data authority does not have, have sufficient, I mean, acknowledges that its powers are limited to make sure that the rights of everyone are respected. So, oh, I... <laughs> so, um... What, what are the stakes? Um, obviously, we, we've, we've mentioned the splitting of these two worlds, two internet, the so one internet with, which is privacy centers and the other, and the consequences that it has. But there are also other stakes coming up. I'm thinking, of course, of the hacking industry, which particularly affects this part of the world. And uh, I'm thinking also about an emerging uh, industry, which is, of course, artificial intelligence, which relies a lot on data. Uh, you may know that Google has recently opened uh, a center, an artificial, cent uh, artificial intelligence center in Accra, in Ghana, to uh, train uh, the greatest number possible uh, of professionals in this domain. But of course, uh, what is, what's going to happen to uh, the data? I mean, how are they going to be used? And uh, how are they going to be uh, stored? Who will be accessing them? And many other questions. But I think more broadly, there is a philosophical question behind all this, which is, do we agree that 
just because you were born on the wrong hemisphere or on the wrong continent, you are not entitled to the same data protection as others, meaning that your data can be used freely by anyone who has the best to the worst idea possible? Or do we think that indeed we're equal, even and especially on the network, we should remember that this network was also invented to make sure, and the web particularly was invented also to make sure that everybody would have equal access to Trinity's knowledge uh, and to the rest of humanity. Or, yeah, what, what is our philosophical uh, thinking? Of course, we agree that everybody should have the same, the same human right. Um, but I think ultimately, what is really at stake is again, going back to this idea of splitting internet. So you know that now there, there is a fierce opposition, especially in, in the parts of the world which are yet to be connected, a fierce opposition between two internet offers. On the one hand, the open and free internet, which we've all enjoyed up until very recently, uh, to some extent, and which for instance, allowed me to be here speaking to you, giving me a voice, as we like to say, or, on the other hand, an internet which is controlled, which helps repressive regime maintain themselves. Obviously, governments in Qatar and Africa will make the choice of a tool that can help them maintain themselves. But I think companies have an opportunity here to have allies in users. Of course, users want, want an internet that empowers them. When you have your privacy protected, you're empowered as a citizen, you're empowered as an internet user. It gives you more opportunities. So if companies make sure that they have allies in the person of users, that they offer them an internet that's centered around and services, internet services that are centered around their privacy, they will make sure that these citizens, whenever the governments will want to block these services, disrupt internet or any other censorship measure, they will make, they are sure that this government, these citizens, sorry, will oppose their governments in the fiercest way to make sure that they will have access to tools that are empowering them. But that again is the responsibility of private companies. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I thank you for your attention. And if you want more information, please visit our website and don't hesitate. Thank you. We'll do some questions. If anyone's got any, please raise your hand. Somebody will come to you with a mic. If you're familiar with the John Le Carre novel, The Constant Gardener, which talks about the exploitation of African communities by drug companies that use them as historically have used them as guinea pigs because of the lack of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, you'll obviously see some parallels here. It's a form of neo-colonialization. Neo um, but I wondered, there's been a lot of investment by China in many sub-Saharan African countries, and China's internet model is obviously closed, and China is donating technology and know-how to many of these countries. Do you think China's influence is um, a factor in the direction being taken by governments who are making decisions about which model of internet governance to adopt? Obviously, um, and I'll and I'll, I, I've seen that. I mean, we we've observed that um, uh, with our work in another in, in another issue on another issue which is related to free expression. So. Uh, there are increasingly governments um, relying on shutting down the internet whenever some political, I mean, something political happens, they don't like it. So what we have observed is that the techniques used to censor the internet are increasingly sophisticated and look weirdly almost exactly like what is being practiced in, in China. For instance, we remember when Ai Weiwei, um, uh, sorry, no, no no, no, I went, uh, sorry, I forgot. Luke Xiaobo, sorry, I almost made a mistake, sorry. <laughs> when Luke Xiaobo passed away, unfortunately, we remember that 
users reported that they could not share the pictures or post about it uh, on the internet. Well, we're seeing that as well in certain parts of, of Africa that on WhatsApp, people complain that they cannot share videos on certain subjects. So uh, it's a matter of investigation, but obviously, yes, the, the, China is a, the first economic partner and financial partners of many countries. So, and at the recent um, um, summit between China and Africa, tech issue became one of the leading issues of this collaboration. So obviously, that's why, that, that hence my call today. Um, we need allies uh, in order to make sure that, well, the, this, I mean, a closed internet does not become the principle for certain parts of the world, and particularly so. Hi, thanks for the talk just now. I suppose I'm interested in, you know, what, what incentives can be put in place for sub-Saharan African governments to implement strong user protections? And also, you know, what incentives can be put in place for companies operating in, in that market? As far as states are concerned, uh, I think sovereignty is going to be a very important issue. Uh, data is a well, personal data of citizens is obviously becoming also a sovereignty issue because whoever access, has access to who your citizens are can manipulate your citizens uh, in the way they want. Uh, so for governments, yes, um, sovereignty. And of course, uh, AI industry, you know, you, you can, you can um, harness the artificial in intelligence revolution for your or your economic development. So obviously, these are arguments that work. For companies, um, well, I think, uh, as, I as I was trying to, to, to advocate for, um, increasingly, these companies are, are challenged on the, the services that they use, and they're increasingly blocked from uh, being accessed, accessed sorry, by uh, populations in those uh, regions. So. Um, the, we, uh, increasingly, citizens are pushing the boundaries uh, set by their governments in terms of uh, oppression and, uh, and the censorship. I'll give an example. Recently in, in Benin, which is a very, I mean, a small in, in, the, in the size country in West Africa, uh, where the government had adopted what they call a social media tax, so taxing people just because they use WhatsApp. Good idea. Uh, and, uh, well, but, citizens pushed back to the point that the government was, uh, had to stop the, 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 the tax. So uh, it means that there is, um, there is a, uh, a dynamic here which should be harnessed. Increasingly, citizens have the power and the ability to push their governments to, to, for, to perform better. And I think, yes, that's probably a good incentive. If you don't do that, your service won't be accessed by potentially one billion users. I mean, And of course, human rights um, violations cost you more than making sure that your products are human rights friendly. Hi, Julie. I'm uh, Federica. It's really nice to meet you. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, my question is, in discussions with big Western tech companies like Facebook, but well, not only, also YouTube, etc., the products that people use in markets where internet is more expensive or those are essentially different platforms. Mm. Uh, they're limited data platforms. And I sometimes wonder whether um, in discussions about things like newsfeed, ad targeting, etc., that these users are basically underrepresented. And my question to you is, what can organizations that are based in Europe or the US do to pressure tech companies based in the US to make sure that all users are represented equally? That's uh, very very important question and we're still trying to, to find the, the best solution. Um, I guess one of the ways to go is to tell these companies that if you don't pay attention, your products are going to, to be used to be tested to do bad, like we've seen in the case of um, Cambridge Analytica, which I mentioned, uh, which I don't think these companies want. I mean, they want their, their products to bring people together, not to cause polarized, uh, polarization uh, in society. I mean, theory. 
they want. They say they want that. So, um, so yes, um, they, one, one argument that could be made is that if you don't take the necessary measures, your, the, the flaws within your system, the flaws in your products will always, always be harnessed to be tested in order to be used two, three, five years later in your native market. Let's call them that way. And this will cause you, well, we see the consequences for Facebook in terms of trust between their users and, and the company. So I think this is one, one avenue, avenue that can be explored and that can help, yes, indeed, equalize um, privacy. Make sure that there is no, um, no weak link in the, in the, the network. Yeah, a couple of hands raised here, but oh, we're yeah. going to have to uh, oh. stop it there. Would you you can chat up? Can we um, move on now to our last panel? There's going to be some chairs being put up there. So, Julie, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.